Heathcliff and the Great Hunger. The fourth of the Bronte children, Patrick Bramwell, has not been enshrined among the immortals. Being the brother of those sisters can't have been easy, but Branwell made a more spectacular hash of it than was strictly necessary. Drug addict and alcoholic, flush with dreams of literary grandeur, he ended up as an embezzling ticket clerk on a Yorkshire railway station, scrawled his final document, a begging note for gin, in September 1848, and expired soon after, wasted and bronchitic, in his father's arms. Quaintly enough, he was for a brief period secretary of the local temperance society. He also taught in Sunday school, where he savaged his pupils in befuddled vengeance for his misfortunes. Chronically unemployable, he spent much of his time engaged in raffish carousals with louche artists in the George Hotel, Bradford, and with characteristic ill luck, took up portrait painting just at the point where the industry was being killed off by the daguerreotype. Packed off to London as an art student of promise, he wandered around the capital in a dream, realised how shabby and provincial he appeared among the metropolitan crowd, and kept his letters of introduction to famous artists firmly in his pocket. He washed up instead in an East End pub where he drank away his money and returned to Haworth with a pathetic tale of having been mugged. London had confirmed what he had already suspected, that he had ambitions of megalomaniac proportions and no interest whatsoever in realising them. When he was not busy cadging gin money or chalking up an alarming slate at Haworth's Black Bull pub, he passed much of his time scribbling second-rate prose, experimenting with exotic pseudonyms and drawing pen portraits of himself hanged, stabbed, or licked by the flames of eternal perdition. Bramwell lived, in short, a flamboyant stage Irish existence, obediently conforming to the English stereotype of the feckless Mick. When his Tory father Patrick took to the Haworth hustings, Branwell, enraged at hearing him howled down by the crowd, intervened loyally on his behalf. The local populace demonstrated their displeasure by burning Branwell in effigy, a potato in one hand and a herring in the other. The Brontes may have effaced their Irish origin, but the good people of Haworth evidently kept it well in mind. Not that Branwell was consistently loyal to his father. His agrarian myth, the life of Northangerland, is a murderous edible fantasy, understandably enough for anyone acquainted with the character of Patrick Bronte Sr. Its dissolute, self-destructive protagonist, Alexander Percy, anarchist and aristocrat, is Branwell himself shorn of the dope, spineless and pen-pushing in a railway station. Percy is in hock to the tune of £300,000, a suitably glamorised version of his author's slate at the Black Bull, and is egged on by his rebel comrades to commit parricide to relieve his debts. Prominent in this persuasion is a certain Mr. R.P. King, otherwise known as S-Death, or occasionally, a nice touch this, R.P.'s Death, a revoltingly evil old retainer, who speaks the Yorkshire dialect despite the fact that the tale is set in Africa, and who is clearly the prototype of old Joseph in Wuthering Heights. Percy spearheads a political coup against the agrarian government, flanked by his trusty companions, naughty and lawless. He and his men have bound themselves to atheism and revolution by a sacred oath. Though the rationalist Percy, a stickler for political correctness, concludes the oath with the words, So help me, my mind. Branwell's chronicles, he wrote more than his sister's work put together, are awash with political dissidents, and several of Percy's rebellious comrades are given Irish names. One of his closest confidants, formerly a lawyer, is the son of one William Daniel Henry Montmorency of Derrynane Abbey. Derrynane was the seat of the barrister Daniel O'Connell, who was victoriously concluding his campaign for Catholic emancipation just as Bramwell was in the process of launching his Bramwell's Blackwoods magazine at the age of 12. Alexander Percy is a supremely well-practiced demagogue 
and so, of course, was Daniel O'Connell. When the people of Haworth, stung by Bramwell's defence of a father he loved and hated, burnt him in effigy as a truculent Irish peasant, they may not have been quite as off-target as it might appear. In August 1845, Bramwell took a trip from Haworth to Liverpool. It was on the very eve of the Great Famine, and the city was soon to be thronged with its starving victims. By June 1847, according to one historian, 300,000 destitute Irish had landed in the port. As Emily Bronte's biographer comments, their image, and especially those of the children, were unforgettably depicted in the Illustrated London News, starving scarecrows with a few rags on them, and an animal growth of black hair almost obscuring their features. Many of these children were no doubt Irish speakers. A few months after Bramwell's visit to Liverpool, Emily began writing Wuthering Heights, a novel whose male protagonist, Heathcliff, is picked up starving off the streets of Liverpool by an old Earnshaw. Earnshaw unwraps his greatcoat to reveal to his family a dirty, ragged, black-haired child who speaks a kind of gibberish and who will later be variously labelled beast, savage, lunatic and demon. It is clear that this little Caliban has a nature on which nurture will never stick, and that is simply an English way of saying that he is quite possibly Irish. Possibly, but by no means certainly. Heathcliff may be a gypsy, or like Bertha Mason and Jane Eyre, a creole, or any kind of alien. It is hard to know how black he is, or rather how much of the blackness is pigmentation, and how much of it grime and bile. As for the famine, the dates don't quite fit. The potato blight, Phythoptera infestans, struck in the autumn of 1845, about the time that Emily Bronte was beginning her novel. So that August, the month of Bramwell's visit to Liverpool, would be too early for him to have encountered famine refugees. But there would no doubt have been a good many impoverished Irish immigrants hanging around the city, and it is tempting to speculate that Bramwell ran into some of them and relayed the tale to his sister. There would be something symbolically apt in Bramwell, the Luciferian rebel of the outfit, presenting Emily with the disruptive element of her work, and there is certainly a strong kinship between the brother and the novel's Byronic villain. Wuthering Heights is much preoccupied with the relations between nature and culture, and Heathcliff, described by Catherine Earnshaw as an unreclaimed creature, without refinement, without cultivation, an arid wilderness of firs and windstone, is about as natural as you can get without actually trailing your knuckles along the ground. That, remember, is his lover speaking. Thrushcross Grange, home of the landed gentry in the novel, stands, roughly speaking, for culture, for nature worked up, cultivated and thus concealed. The Grange survives by nature, the Lintons are the biggest landowners in the district, but like much class culture, it includes its own disreputable roots. Culture is the offspring of labour, but, like the edible child, denies its own lowly parentage and fantasises that it was self-born. Culture is either self-parenting or the offspring of previous culture. The Grange's relation to the land is a good deal more mediated than that of the Heights. The Earnshaws at the Heights are gentlefolk, but they are a remnant of the peculiarly English class of yeomen, and yeomen, unlike squires, work their own soil. J.C. Beckett points to the rarity of this sort of class, owning substantial acres of land and employing a number of labourers in small-tenant Ireland. The reverse of the cultivation of nature is the naturalisation of culture, or, in a word, ideology. From Burke to Coleridge to Arnold and Eliot, a dominant ideological device in Britain is to transmute history itself into a seamless evolutionary continuum, endowing social institutions with all the stolid inevitability of a boulder. Society itself, in this view, becomes a marvellous aesthetic organism, self-generating and self-contained. This is a much rarer sort of discourse in Ireland. In Ireland, the land is, of course, an economic and political category, 
and an ethical one too, racy of the soil. It is also, more frequently than in Britain, a sexual subject, as the torn victim of imperial penetration. But it is, by and large, much less of an aestheticized concept. Whereas in England, as John Barrell points out in his study of John Clare, it is hard to think of a word for an extensive tract of land, synchronically surveyed, other than the revealingly painterly term landscape. The English tend to think of paintings first and farms second, just as Jane Austen tends to look at a piece of land and see its price and proprietor, but nobody actually working there. Ellen Wood has pointed to the close connection in English culture between the aesthetic appreciation of landscape and economic improvement in the form of a new rural aesthetic which deliberately joined beauty with productivity and profit. The fact that rural improvement in Ireland was considerably less in evidence may then inspire a different way of perceiving the countryside. The one place in Irish society where the land is aestheticized in this manner is the domain, which is more artifact than agricultural, despite the fact that domain land traditionally represented a sizable percentage of the worked soil. But this, of course, is essentially an English import. Nature in Ireland would often seem more a working environment than an object to be contemplated, which is, in any case, a typically urban way of relating to it. Stopford Brook and T.W. Ralston comment in the preface to their Treasury of Irish Poetry that nature as a theme has not been adequately treated by Irish poets, while John Wilson Foster speculates that responses to nature in ancient Irish writing may come from taking a spontaneous relation to it for granted. But it may also reflect a certain native humanism. Yeats speaks in The Symbolism of Poetry of the need for a casting out of descriptions of nature for the sake of nature, and was certainly true to his own injunction. His natural descriptions have little of the sensuous nuance or close-fraught intricacy of a Keats or a Hopkins, though neither, one might add, do Wordsworth's. It is hard to imagine Wordsworth writing animal poetry, given the bodiless idealism of his feeling for nature. Terence Brown remarks on the scant attention bestowed by Anglo-Irish poetry on features of topography or locale, and considers the suggestion that this may have to do with a certain instability of settlement. Tom Moore's lyric, The Meeting of the Waters, has no sooner praised nature than it qualifies the compliment by claiming that the intimate presence of friends intensifies its enchantment. Aubrey de Vere's poem, The Year of Sorrow, written during the famine, turns from a burgeoning nature to the brute facts of starvation, then offers this natural vitality as a last consolation to the dying. James Clarence Mangan detested nature, which crops up in his work only as part of a paysage moralise. John Nolan, hero of John Banham's novel The Nolans, is puzzled by a gentlewoman's inquiry about which part of his native landscape would be most worth sketching. For him, the scenery is too familiar to be picturesque. Irish literary landscapes are often enough decipherable texts rather than aesthetic objects, places made precious or melancholic by the resonance of the human. It is the inscription of historical or contemporary meaning within their material appearance which tends to engage the poet's attention. Perhaps it was this intrusion of the human into the landscape which Hartley Coleridge had in mind when he remarked that Ireland would be a paradisal place were it not for the Catholics and the Protestants. In response to J.C. Beckett's unpleasantly patronising comment that we have an Ireland an element of stability, the land, and an element of instability, the people, John Wilson Foster remarks that in Irish literature, and I suspect in history, landscape is a cultural code that perpetuates, instead of belying, these instabilities and ruptures. The great Irish antiquarian, George Petrie, professed himself unconcerned with merely copying nature in his paintings. My aim was something beyond that of the ordinary class of portrait painting. It was my wish to produce an Irish picture somewhat historical in its object, and poetical in its sentiment. One is tempted, somewhat fancifully, to find a parallel for this in the idealist thought of the greatest Irish philosopher, for whom nature, as thing in itself, must yield to nature 
as mind-related and subject-centered, a text or language which comes alive only in its transactions with human consciousness. In Berkeley's humanist perspective, matter itself is a mere fetish, a useless abstraction which distracts us from our practical business in the world, and which, like Kant's cryptic noumenon, cancels all the way through to leave everything exactly as it was. Berkeley is quite as hostile as Oscar Wilde to the appearance-reality dichotomy, if for entirely different reasons. But it may also be, as E. Estin Evans suggests, that the Christian faith may have played its part here early on, with its devaluing of the sensuous and natural. And it would seem probable that a landscape traced through with the historical scars of famine, deprivation and dispossession can never present itself to human perception with quite the rococo charm of a Keats, the sublimity of a Wordsworth, or the assured sense of proprietorship of an Austen. The word land in England has romantic connotations, as befits a largely urbanized society, and nature is often enough the antithesis of the social. Ireland also witnesses a romanticizing of the countryside, in contrast to the morally corrupt, English-oriented metropolis, but this is more of an ethical than an aesthetic matter, and the English romantic opposition of nature and society is less easy to sustain in a country where the land is visibly a question of social relations and the town more continuous with its rural surroundings. Edna Longley discerns a tension in the imagination of Patrick Kavanagh between country poet and nature poet. Land in Ireland is a political rallying cry as well as a badge of cultural belonging, a question of rents as well as roots. It is not, need one say, that Irish writing reveals no sense of natural beauty. It is rather the absence of a particular ideology of that beauty which is peculiarly marked in Britain. Thomas Macdonough, in his Literature in Ireland, praises early Irish literature for its delicate natural observation, but agrees with Kuno Mayer that such description is usually more impressionistic than elaborated. This is not nature poetry in the sense of writing self-consciously about landscape as a value in itself. Whatever the cause, it would seem that the naturalizing strategies of English ideology don't stick so well in Ireland. To claim that the ascendancy ruled, but was never entirely able to hegemonize that rule, is to suggest that it could never properly naturalize it. Whilst a new system has been given to the country, remarks the distinguished surgeon and literary scholar George Sigerson, little trouble has been taken to naturalize it. Irish history is too palpably ruptured and discontinuous for the tropes of a sedate English evolutionism to take hold, and the latent triumphalism of such metaphors is flagrantly inappropriate to it. Nor is it very plausible to imagine a social order so physiored by social conflict as a mysteriously self-renewing organic entity, though a certain line of romantic nationalist discourse did its best. Nature may figure in Ireland as an ethico-political category as well as an economic one. It may even be seen as a kind of subject, but this is not quite the transcendental vitalist subject which informs English speculations on the natural world from Coleridge to Lawrence. It is hard to imagine an Irish Ruskin, apart perhaps from George Petrie, though there are even today in Ireland a few constructive unionists thinly masquerading as Hibernian Arnolds. Nature in Ireland is moralized and sexualized, and insofar as it is alive with mythic forces, it is also transcendentalized. But it would appear on the whole less an object of aesthetic perception than in England, and one reason for this is not hard to find. It is that nature in Ireland is too stubbornly social and material a category, too much a matter of rent, conacher, pigs and potatoes, for it to be distanced, stylized and subjectivated in quite this way. Jim Daly, a character in Charles Lever's novel The Adonahue, 1845, makes the point after conducting some dewy-eyed English visitors around his district. They've ways of their own, the English, interrupted Jim, for whenever we passed a little potato garden it was always, God be good to us, but they're mighty poor hereabouts. But when we got into the real wild part of the glen, with divil a house nor a human being near us, Saw a word out of their mouths, but fine, beautiful, elegant, till we came to Keemane, 
and then you'd think it was 50 acres of wheat they were looking at, with all the praises they had for the big rocks and black cliffs over our heads. The embarrassment of Irish society in this respect is that it gives the vulgar Marxist far too easy a ride. When material history bulks so blatantly large, when the connections between acreage, soil fertility, human fertility, sexual mores, social relations and modes of perception are so visibly on show, who needs to engage in elaborate theoretical defences of the model of base and superstructure? But British society presents a somewhat parallel embarrassment. For throughout the British 19th century, a chronically idealising, aestheticising discourse of both nature and society was secretly at loggerheads with an altogether more gross, materialist language, heavy with biological ballast and grotesquely bereft of culture. This was the language of bourgeois political economy, which speaks of men and women as labouring instruments and fertilising mechanisms in a kind of savage Swiftian reduction utterly out of key with the legitimating idiom of cultural idealism. The problem for the ruling British order was that this brutally practical discourse threatened to demystify its own idealizations, and this, in part, reflects a conflict between a kind of language organic to the industrial middle class, and one largely inherited by it from its patrician predecessors. Ireland, in this as in other ways, then comes to figure as the monstrous unconscious of the metropolitan society the secret materialist history of endemically idealist England. It incarnates, for Carlyle, Froude and others, the Tennysonian nightmare of a nature red in tooth and claw, obdurately resistant to refinement. For Carlyle, Ireland is the breaking point of the huge suppuration which all British and European society now is, the neuralgic spot or open secret of a more general malaise. Such an existence seemed hardly worth sustaining. The Irish, commented Chief Secretary Balfour in 1892, ought to have been exterminated long ago, but it is too late now. The unconscious, however, is a site of ambivalence. If Ireland is raw, turbulent, destructive, it is also a locus of play, pleasure, fantasy, a blessed release from the tyranny of the English reality principle. Ireland is the biological time bomb which can be heard ticking softly away beneath the civilised superstructures of the Pall Mall clubs, and its history offers to lay bare the murky material roots of that civility as pitilessly as does Heathcliff. When the child Heathcliff trespasses on the Grange, the neurasthenically cultivated Lintons set the dogs on him, forced for a moment to expose the veiled violence which helps to prop them up. There is another sense in which Ireland figured as Britain's unconscious, just as we indulge in the world of the id, in actions which the ego would find intolerable. So 19th century Ireland became the place where the British were forced to betray their own principles in a kind of negation or inversion of their conscious beliefs. It was the scene of an intensive state intervention which mocked its own laissez-faire doctrines. It was the place where it was forced to make grudging political concessions to physical force movements. It was the country whose custom-bound, unwritten sense of rights on the land it had finally to respect, against the grain of its own contractualist ideology. And it was an island ruled by a land-owning oligarchy, which it was forced in the end to expropriate. Ireland represented a rebarbative world which threatened to unmask Britain's own civility. And no doubt some excessively ingenious critic could uncover an allegory for this in the picture of Dorian Gray. Ireland as nature to England's culture, then. But the terms can be just as easily reversed. For Ireland is also tradition and spirituality, in contrast to its rulers' crass materialism, aristocracy to their bourgeoisie. Indeed, insofar as the Irish are natural aristocrats, they offer to deconstruct the entire opposition and win themselves the best of both worlds. Irish nationalism, one might venture, begins with nature the rights of man, and ends up as culture. When John Kells Ingram, Isaac Boot, John Elliot Cairns or Thomas Kettle question the applicability to Irish conditions of the natural operation of market forces, they are countering naturalism with the language of culturalism. In his The Character and Logical Method of Political Economy, 
Cairns claims that political economy is a science rather than an art, but what he seems to mean by this is that it should be disinterested rather than ideological, a question of principles rather than a defence of the economic status quo. There are indeed certain immutable economic laws derived from human nature and psychology, but these laws, so Cairns claims, are hypothetical only, meaning that they are continually moulded by custom and circumstance. T. E. Cliff Leslie, another distinguished 19th century Irish economist, boldly relativizes Adam Smith's economics as the product of a particular social history, stresses the uncertainty of scientific knowledge and the importance of culturally variable sentiment, and seeks to relocate political economy within the whole moral and intellectual context of social life. He also casts doubt on a science of man which disregards the other, female half of the human race and highlights the economic importance of the domestic sphere. John Kells Ingram, a Comtean of sorts, views political economy as an integral branch of sociology and condemns Adam Smith both for his unhistorical method and for failing to regard wealth as a means to the higher ends of life. In Ruskinian style, the so-called Dublin School of Political Economists moralised and historicised the laws which their British counterparts regarded as amoral and immutable. Behind their emphasis on the complex interweaving of law and custom, sentiment and sociology, the tones of Edmund Burke are dimly detectable. Heathcliff is a fragment of the famine and goes on a sort of hunger strike towards the end of his life, as indeed does Catherine Earnshaw. Raymond Williams speaks of the Brontes' fiction in terms of the English 1840s, a world of desire and hunger, of rebellion and pallid convention, the terms of desire and fulfilment and the terms of oppression and deprivation profoundly connected in a single dimension of experience. The hunger in Wuthering Heights is called Heathcliff, a creature not of my species, as Nellie Dean frostily remarks, with his half-civilized ferocity but the hunger in Ireland was rather more literal. On the very threshold of modernity, Ireland experienced in the famine all the blind primeval force of the pre-modern, of a history as apparently remorseless as nature itself, a history not naturalised but natural, a matter of blight and typhus, and men and women crawling into the churchyard so as to die on sacred soil. In one sense, there was nothing very natural about this pre-eminently political catastrophe, but whereas in the British context history becomes nature, in Ireland nature becomes history. And this both in the sense that, in a largely pre-industrial society, the land is the prime determinant of human life, and in the sense that in the famine history appears with all the brute, aleatory power of a seismic upheaval, thus writing large the course of much Irish history. The British have naturalised their own social relations as providential, and the effects of nature in this sense will then appear over the water as nature in its most Schopenhauerian guise. This in turn will feed back to the metropolitan nation as an image of the very Darwinism which is just about to shake them to their ideological foundations. Nature as random and purposeless, as a shattered landscape lurking as a terrifying possibility at the root of their own civility. Ireland and Wuthering Heights are names for that civility's sickening precariousness, for it too had in its time to be wrested inch by inch from the soil, and is thus permanently capable of sliding back into it. Wherever you find meaning, so Freud taught us, you are bound to uncover non-meaning at its root. The famine is the threatened death of the signifier in just this sense, the fear of history collapsing inertly under its own excess weight into sheer material process. Other European societies endured their crises and conflagrations in the late 1840s, but these, at least, were a matter of heroic action and revolutionary rhetoric. The young islander, Fintan Lalore, viewed the famine as a kind of negative revolution, as the dissolution of society, and thus as a deeper social disorganisation than the French Revolution, greater waste of life, wider loss of property, more than the horrors, with none of the hopes. Ireland's disaster was a kind of inverted image of European turmoil, one which you suffer rather than create, which strips culture to the poor, forked, Bicettian creature, and which, in threatening to slip below the level of meaning itself, offers to deny you even the meagre consolations of tragedy.
What lingers on in such contaminated remnants of the epoch as the language itself would seem less tragedy than the very different culture of shame. During the famine, starving families boarded themselves into their cabins so that their deaths might go decently unviewed. After the event, there were villages which could still speak Irish, but didn't. It was considered bad luck. And to touch on the language question is to consider a death of the signifier, or a rather different order. The famine is apparently non-signifying, then, not only because it figures, ideologically speaking, as a brute act of nature, but also because it threatens to burst through the bounds of representation, as surely as Auschwitz did for Theodore Adorno. Though at least, so some thought about the Holocaust, you could ascribe it to a subject of some kind, a transcendentally evil one, whereas a blankly indifferent nature is not even enough of a subject to be malevolent. Cormac O'Grada has remarked on the striking paucity of Irish historical writing on the famine, a project which has been largely delegated to non-Irish scholars. And this wary silence has already been noted by James Connolly in his Labour in Irish History. But a parallel repression or evasion would seem to be at work in Irish literary culture, which is hardly rife with allusions to the event. There is indeed a literature of the famine, which has been valuably explored and anthologized by Christopher Marash. But it is in neither sense of the word a major literature. There is a handful of novels and a body of poems, but few truly distinguished works. Where is the famine in the literature of the revival? Where is it in Joyce? There is a question here, when it comes to the revival, of the politics of form. Much of that writing is programmatically non-representational, and thus no fit medium for historical realism, if indeed any fit medium for such subject matter is conceivable. Wild, Moor and Yeats are in full flight from nature towards whatever style, pose, mask or persona might seem its antithesis, and the more Joyce recuperates this naturalistic region for the ends of art, the more obtrusively artificial that redemption becomes. If the famine stirred some to angry rhetoric, it would seem to have traumatised others into muteness. The event strains at the limits of the articulable, and is truly, in this sense, the Irish Auschwitz. In both cases, there would seem something trivialising or dangerously familiarising about the very act of representation itself. Liam O'Flaherty published a magnificent novel, Famine, in 1937, and the playwright Tom Murphy has bravely tackled the subject on stage. But there are a number of curious literary near-misses, William Carlton's novel, The Black Prophet, published during the famine, concerns a previous such disaster. Yeats's play, The Countess Kathleen, treats of famine, but of no specific one. Patrick Kavanagh's poem, The Great Hunger, which shares the title of Cecil Woodham Smith's celebrated study of the subject, uses famine as a metaphor for sexual and spiritual hungering. It is not quite that the famine strikes narrative cohesion out of Irish history. There are central continuities across it, and many developments which were once thought to postdate the event. Mass emigration, language decline, late marriage, impartable inheritance, land consolidation, the so-called devotional revolution, were perhaps already in train before its occurrence. It is rather that the famine offers to reduce that history to what Walter Benjamin might have called the sheer, empty, homogenous time of the body, to insert, rather like Heathcliff, the disruptive temporality of nature itself into the shapely schemas of historical chronology. In one sense, nature has reared up and wreaked its terrible vengeance upon history. In another sense, it images how that history had always in part appeared, ousting it at one level while miming it at another. The mediations between nature and culture are such things as food, labour, reproduction, the body, and all of these vital links have now been literally sundered. Culture is the surplus we have over stark need, and a social order shorn of that creative surplus can no longer make history at all, if indeed it ever properly could. History, like nature, is now just an unmasterable exteriority, forever outrunning your control. This, interestingly enough, is also implicit in the naturalizing imagery of England, the sense that history is less something you strenuously fashion than spontaneously transmit, a lineage powered by its own inscrutably autonomous laws. 
The English and the Irish both have history in their bones in entirely different senses. But we are talking here of teleology, and with the famine such teleology can only ever be retrospective, constructed backwards after the unspeakable has already happened. Irish history would appear to have all the necessity of that teleological drive, but to absolutely no beneficent end. A necessity, in short, without a telos, implacable but distinctly unprovidential. The historical narrative, like the Chinese box structure of Wuthering Heights, is strangely scrambled. The modern period in Ireland flows from an origin which is also an end, an abyss into which one quarter of the population disappears. Because of the famine, Irish society undergoes a surreal speed-up of its entry upon modernity, but what spurs that process on is, contradictorily, a thoroughly traditional calamity. Part of the horror of the famine is its atavistic nature, the mind-shaking fact that an event with all the pre-modern character of a medieval pestilence happened in Ireland with frightening recentness. This deathly origin then shatters space as well as time, unmaking the nation and scattering Irish history across the globe. That history will, of course, continue, but as in Emily Bronte's novel, there is something recalcitrant at its core which defeats articulation, some real which stubbornly refuses to be symbolized. In both cases, this real is a voracious desire which was beaten back and defeated, which could find no place in the symbolic order of social time, and was expunged from it, but which, like the shades of Catherine and Heathcliff, will return to haunt a history now in the process of regathering its stalled momentum and moving onwards and upwards. Some primordial trauma has taken place, which fixates your development at one level, even as you continue to unfold at another, so that time in Irish history and Wuthering Heights would seem to move backwards and forwards simultaneously, Something, anyway, for good or ill, has been irrevocably lost, and in both Ireland and the novel, it takes up its home on the alternative terrain of myth. Wuthering Heights tells its story back to front, gazing back on the tragic storm from the vantage point of calm, fashioning a retrospective teleology of sorts. The uncouth Hareton has now been levered into the Grange, and the love of a good woman will ensure that whatever was energizing about Heathcliff will live on in him, in tamed and civilized form. The gentry have reached out to the stout yeomanry and infused their own overbred civility with something of that racy vigor. Or, to put the matter differently, the British are once more busily appropriating the more admirable qualities of the Celt. We are teetering here on the very brink of Matthew Arnold's, on the study of Celtic literature, which will engage in precisely such an ideological manoeuvre. Even the famine will yield a retrospective teleology of sorts to those of a Malthusian frame of mind, and there were plenty in Victorian London who saw it as providential. When man has failed to rule the world rightly, comments Anthony Trollope in The Land Leaguers, God will step in and will cause famine and plague and pestilence, even poverty itself, with his own right arm. The moral crassness of this is as unoriginal as most of Trollope's pronouncements. The position is lifted wholesale from Malthus's essay on population, which sees famine as a last-ditch divine corrective to human vice. For the Trollope of Castle Richmond, the famine is the consequence of God's mercy rather than his wrath, undoing the results of human folly and converting Ireland into a pleasant and prosperous land. Nothing but the successive failures of the potato, wrote Lord Lansdowne's agent W.S. Trench, could have produced the emigration which will, I trust, give us room to become civilised. In the famine, Charles Trevelyan remarked, An all-merciful providence and supreme wisdom has adduced permanent good out of transient evil, a moral obscenity which might have mattered rather less had Trevelyan not been in charge of the relief operation. Trevelyan held that the effects of the famine should not be too thoroughly mitigated by British aid, so that its improvident victims might learn their lesson. He also considered death by starvation a lesser evil than bankruptcy, and was restrained in his abuse of the Irish only by his belief that as a Cornishman he stemmed from the same race. 
the disaster in Trevelyan's view had miraculously resolved most of the country's problems, forcing its warring sects into cooperative action, fostering self-reliance, quelling agrarian militancy, and modernizing the economy. The only problem for Nassau Sr., one of Britain's most influential economists, was whether the president of the immortals would accomplish his work thoroughly enough. A million deaths, he confided to the master Balliol, would scarcely be enough to do much good. Even Robert Peel, generally applauded for his judicious response to the onset of hunger, shared this providentialist perspective. For some British officials, the famine was a sign of divine displeasure with the potato and a golden opportunity for the Irish to shift to a less barbarous form of nourishment. In a kind of dietary determinism, a less lowly food would produce a more civilised and hence less politically belligerent people. What scandalised these commentators was the apparent bovine contentment of the Irish with their humdrum, socially unaspiring existence. And since growing potatoes involved little labour, it confirmed them in their endemic indolence. It is small wonder that some nationalists were stirred, however misguidedly, to speak of genocide. Even as sober a commentator as George Sigerson is writing as late as 1868 of a policy of extermination for Ireland, in which men and women will give way to cattle. One can, if one is so inclined, trace the providential pattern all the way from death, eviction and emigration to clearances, the consequent consolidation of land for pasturage, and the resulting emergence of a relatively prosperous rural middle class who would then form the material base for political independence. And if the famine helped to lay the economic ground for independence, it also dealt the single most lethal blow to whatever frail legitimacy the Irish ruling class could still muster. Even the meaningless will prove finally meaningful, as what is absolute loss for particular men and women becomes grist to the Hegelian mill. It is a process of which one can find a microcosm in the ancient Irish practice of hunger striking, which seeks to retrieve historical meaning from pure biological passivity, rest significance from sheer facticity. But even the most dedicated dialectician is bound to balk a little at this sanguine vista. If there is some providence stealthily afoot here, it would seem to have had to cancel itself out in order to realise itself, things having grown so extreme that only from some catastrophic engulfment of the present could new life begin to stir. Nature has thrown off the dead, as, in a causal afterthought, it threw off the living in the first place. In fact, things didn't have to happen that way, as Wuthering Heights, in this allegorical reading of it, can be persuaded to testify. Nature, for English pastoral ideology, is plenitude and bountiful resource. In Irish culture, and Bronte's novel, it may occasionally be that too, but it also figures as harsh, niggardly, mean-spirited, and so as peasant, rather than aristocrat. The Heights is more imposing than many an Irish farm, but what governs interpersonal relations in both cases is a tight material economy of labour, kinship, and inheritance. For all the critical blather about transcendence and romantic love, few more tenaciously materialist fictions have flowed from an English pen, than this genealogically obsessed work, in which law, property, and inheritance are the very stuff of the plot, and kinship the very structure of the narrative. Personal relations can be left to the Lintons, who have enough money to go in for them. One can scarcely speak of whatever it is that binds Catherine and Heathcliff together as a relationship, since the word implies an alterity they refuse. When the middle-class Lockwood first stumbles into the heights, he is farcically incapable of deciphering the characters' relationships, since they are little more than a grisly parody of a conventional family. It is history, property and power which have thrown them together, not connubial love or filial affection. Heathcliff is adopted into the Earnshaw Ménage and ends up by biting the hand that feeds him. Show kindness to these savages and they will kick you in the teeth. In fact, Heathcliff revolts, rather like Ireland against Britain, because of the barbarous way he is treated. Only Catherine will grant him the recognition he demands, and even she, perfidious little Albion that she is, sells him out for Edgar Linton. In the end, even the liberals will rally to the landowners. 
the Heathcliff Catherine relationship is a classic case of the Lacanian imaginary, an utter merging of identities in which the existence of each is wholly dependent on the existence of the other, to the exclusion of the world about them. But young Catherine must assume her allotted place in the symbolic order, leaving her anguished companion historically arrested in the imaginary register. Catherine and Heathcliff, an oppressed woman and an exploited farm labourer, have a chance, so it would seem, to inaugurate a form of relationship at odds with the instrumental economy of the Heights. But Catherine's renegacy prevents that relationship from entering upon material existence, just as it compels Heathcliff to run off, turn himself into a gentleman, and appropriate the weapons of the ruling class in order to bring them low. Unlike Oscar Wilde, the traitor William Joyce, Lord Haw Haw, or Winston Churchill's Irish secretary Brendan Bracken, Heathcliff doesn't make too good a job of turning himself into an English gentleman. You can take Heathcliff out of the heights, but you can't take the heights out of Heathcliff. Emily's father succeeded rather better. Born to a poor Irish peasant family, he Frenchified his surname and made it to Cambridge. Right-wing Toryism and Anglican orders. Heathcliff, by contrast, is a notoriously split subject. If he goes through the motions of undermining the ruling order from within, his soul remains arrested and fixated in the imaginary relation with Catherine. Indeed, he engages in the former kind of activity precisely to avenge himself for the unavailability of the latter. Heathcliff starts out as an image of the famished Irish immigrant, becomes a landless labourer set to work in the Heights, and ends up as a symbol of the constitutional nationalism of the Irish Parliamentary Party. It is certainly a remarkably prescient novel, rather in the manner of Balzac's Les Paysans, which George Moore thought extraordinarily clairvoyant about later agrarian developments in Ireland. Like those Redmanites who were both ranchers and rebels, Heathcliff is oppressor and oppressed in one body, condensing in his own person the various stages of the Irish Revolution. As a child, he is a kind of defender or ribbon man, chased out of the Grange in a minor rural outrage because the landlord thinks he is after his rents. He then shifts from rural proletarian, a dying breed in post-famine Ireland, to rural bourgeois, cheating Hindley out of his possession of the heights. And in this, one might claim, he recapitulates the drift of the land league, which originated with the labourers, cottiers and smallholders of Connaught, only to end up in the pockets of the conservative rural middle class. Once installed in the heights, Heathcliff becomes a pitiless landlord himself and sets about dispossessing the local landowner and taking over the grange. This, indeed, is just what the Irish farmers will eventually do, or at least what the British state will do on their behalf. But there is a significant difference here between British and Irish class history. The English squirearchy, the oldest landed capitalist class in Europe, will finally oust the superannuated yeomanry. And in this sense, at the end of Wuthering Heights, the Grange wins out over the Heights. Heathcliff dies in enigmatic ecstasy. The middle-class challenge to the landowners is accordingly beaten off, and young Catherine will reassume her proper place as heiress of the Grange, taking the farouche Hareton with her to inject a dose of earthy vigour into the place. The anarchic eruption of nature into culture has been fended off, that moment, the transgressive moment of Heathcliff and Catherine Earnshaw, is then distanced into mythology, and an evolutionary history all but blown to bits by it can now resume its stately upward trek. Heathcliff dramatises, among other things, a ruling class fear of revolution from below, but his furious insurrectionary energy now lies quiet in the grave, and by the close of the novel, the stormy liaison with Catherine seems a long way off. One can't, however, banish from one's mind what just might have happened, the dreadful possibility that this raging resentment might finally come to usurp the gentry themselves. This is what will happen in Ireland, half a century on from the novel, and it is what very nearly happens in the novel too, since Heathcliff does in fact get his hands on the Grange, but dies before he can enjoy his victory. If Heathcliff is the rural revolution, however, he is that revolution gone sour. Indeed, he represents its betrayal as well as its near triumph, its right as well as its left wing. As the Irish parliamentarians were often enough warned, you can't play the enemy's game, assume his political persona, and steal his cultural clothes, and hope to remain unscathed in your radical idealism.
It is worth recalling, however, that before women and the working class achieved a presence in the House of Commons, the Irish Parliamentary Party was the one representative there of an oppressed people. Heathcliff is forced to nurture his idealism, his love for Catherine, in some quite separate inward sphere, in the realms of myth, the imaginary and cherished childhood memory, while behaving externally like any predatory English landlord. And this destructive non-congruence of myth and reality has a long history in Ireland. Heathcliff, like Marx's petty bourgeoisie, is contradiction incarnate, forced to inflect his desire in terms which can only alienate it. And in the end, that contradiction will tear him apart. He has tried to outmaneuver the enemy at his own game, but his heart isn't in it, and he dies of unappeasable longing. He was a foreign brat who grew too big for his boots, and the English have long experience of how to take care of that. He is a landlord who eats in the kitchen, without grace or civility, brutal in his personal dealings. And to this extent, he resembles a stereotypically uncouth minor ascendancy figure more than he does anything out of Jane Austen. Indeed, if one wanted a direct Irish comparison, one might do worse than place him alongside the scheming, hard-faced, aggressive Charlotte Mullen of Somerville and Ross's The Real Charlotte, another exploiter whose monstrous violence is fueled by disappointment in love. One can, of course, try on a suitably revisionist reading of the whole affair. Like many Irish nationalists, Catherine Heathcliff are in this view regressively fixated in some romanticised past, and would never have made it into the symbolic order of modern historical time. It is hard to imagine Heathcliff doing the dishes or wheeling the pram. Catherine, on such a reading, is no kind of renegade. She is an unprotected woman who is unlikely to find the security she needs with such a disreputable partner. Ed Galinton, the Irish revisionist historian would be delighted to note, is not a bad sort of landlord. He may be something of a sap, but his love for Catherine is tender and steadfast, whatever Heathcliff's macho contempt for it. Like all of the Irish in a certain colonial view of them, Heathcliff is the eternal child, and his adult wheeler dealing is ironically driven by this implacable infantile demand. Unable to deal maturely with his rejection, he ends up with all the smouldering, self-lacerating hatred of a John Mitchell, or the blustering desperation of Parnell in his last days. There is an archaic weight of history with which English society has become entangled, and which is threatening to drag it down, and its name is Heathcliff. Or Ireland. Better, surely, to shuck it off and face the future. But Heathcliff, like the Irish Revolution itself, is archaic and modern together, a mournful remembrance of past wrongs, which then unleashes a frenetically transformative drive to the future. That drive is in both cases thwarted, goes awry, but behind it lurks the memory of a bungled utopian moment, a subjunctive mood which still haunts the hills and refuses to lie quiet in its grave. From the gentry standpoint, the novel recounts the tale of a catastrophe just averted. From a radical viewpoint, it records the loss of revolutionary hopes, now projected into a mythologized past, but, like the ghosts of Catherine and Heathcliff, still capable of infiltrating and disturbing the present. For their doomed relationship, despite its grotesque violence, and perhaps because of its curiously genderless quality, involved an equality, solidarity, and full mutual recognition, which, had it been to the fore as a political ethic in the Land League, might have made a considerable difference to the subsequent course of Irish history. Meanwhile, the Lockwoods and Deans of the present, who, as usual, can't even hear the question, let alone provide an answer, continue to worry away at the hermeneutical riddle which haunts every page of Wuthering Heights. Who is Heathcliff? What is he? What does he want? The naturalizing discourse of English culture may be less native to Ireland, but it has certainly been powerfully to the fore in much Irish discussion of the famine. The typical gesture of Irish historiography on the subject has been to take the property relations of 19th century Ireland for granted as some unquestionable context, and then to argue the toss within these constricted terms. In this, Irish historians reenact the mental habits of the Victorian political economists who similarly assumed that the frame of capitalist relations in Ireland fell beyond the bounds of criticism. Much historical debate over the famine is thus loaded from the outset, secretly governed by what it dogmatically excludes as a legitimate topic of inquiry. 
given those property relations, the famine was arguably inevitable once the potato crop failed, but there was nothing inevitable about the relations themselves. Irish historians who are quick to pounce on the taken-for-grantedness of nationalist mythology are curiously blind to their own naturalizing habits of mind. Most historians are unwitting positivists, wary of what Hegel called the power of the negative, reluctant to grasp what happened in the light of what did not. They are also, commonly enough, ethical relativists in practice, if not in theory, given to exculpating some piece of historical inhumanity on the grounds that one could have expected nothing more high-minded of the age in which it occurred. They contrast in this way with most Marxists who are apt to claim that, say, slavery was a gross human injustice, even if it is hard to see how, in a particular historical situation, anything different could have been imagined. In a typical comment, Mary Daly writes of the British government's handling of famine relief that it does not appear appropriate to pronounce in an unduly critical fashion on the limitations of previous generations. Why not? Does that also apply to witch burning, lunatic baiting and child labour? More to the point, does it apply to agrarian outrages, dynamiting, the assassination of chief secretaries or the slaying of unpopular landlords? It is the social worker theory of morality. Caligula was just the victim of social circumstance. We should seek to understand the headhunters rather than condemn them. It is just that the revisionist historian's admiral broad-mindedness seems to stop mysteriously short of John Mitchell or Patrick Pierce. The Irish landlords, writes E.R.R. Green of the famine, held the ultimate responsibility, but on the whole they were as much involved in disaster as their tenantry. It would be intriguing to know Dr. Green's statistics for the number of landlords dead of hunger or edema in the workhouses or shipped off typhus-ridden to Canada, but at least he attributes a degree of responsibility to them, however abstractly ultimate, which for some other Irish historians is fighting talk. The treatment of the famine in L. M. Cullen's an economic history of Ireland since 1600, is extraordinarily cursory, unsurprisingly perhaps for a historian who can write elsewhere that the land system and economic behaviour of the landlords as a class were not reprehensible. It is worth pointing out that if this complacency is warranted, then an immense proportion of the literary evidence about the land in Ireland can be written off as worthless. Literary testimony is not, to be sure, hard historical evidence. But it is an odd historical judgment which can run clean counter to such a major body of writing. Perhaps everyone from Edgeworth and Banham to Carlton and Moore was simply cursed with too lurid an imagination. Some modern Irish historians, including L. M. Cullen, are not quite so quick to set aside literary evidence when it comes to arguing that, say, early modern Ireland was not, in general, nationalistic. As far as the famine goes, we are dealing with the most important episode of modern Irish history, and the greatest social disaster of 19th century Europe, an event with something of the characteristics of a low-level nuclear attack. The zealous sanitizing of the subject in R.D. Edwards and T.D. Williams' collection of essays, The Great Famine, is as tendentious as any nationalist polemic. Mary Daly's judicious, informative account, one by no means uncritical of Westminster, half excuses the laissez-faire dogmatism of the Whig government by remarking that the Society of Friends entertained similar beliefs about private property. It is doubtful that Daly would exculpate the ribbon men on the grounds that the defenders believed in shooting bailiffs too. R. F. Foster briefly allows that the Whigs' relief policies were generally ill-founded in a narrative that is otherwise scrupulous to avoid assigning blame. It has been fashionable among Irish historians to scorn Cecil Woodham Smith's The Great Hunger as a popular tearjerker, but although the book has its crop of errors and exaggerations, it is remarkable how much of its account is confirmed by the recent findings of James S. Donnelly Jr., whom nobody could accuse of either amateurism or anglophobia. There was no question of calculated genocide, and food imports, contrary to nationalist mythology, far outstripped exports in the famine years. But neither was the famine an act of God. Peel's government moved quickly and effectively, the apparatus of public works and soup kitchens was extended with commendable efficiency into the remotest reaches of the island, and some landlords devoted themselves selflessly to the parlous condition of their tenants, bankrupting themselves in the process. Taken as a whole, however, the landowners were precious little use, 
when their actions were not positively damaging. As for the government's record, the failure to stop the grain harvest of 1846 from being exported before foreign aid arrived in early 47 had lethal consequences. The hiatus in the 1847 relief operation between the closure of public works and the opening of the soup kitchens sent many to their graves. The government denial of an emergency after 1847, along with its decision to abandon famine relief, was criminal. The ideological refusal to distribute free food until thousands had perished, the dumping of famine costs on Ireland alone, and on a ramshackle poor law system. The Whig abandonment of the food depot project, the limiting of public works for fear of inhibiting private charity, the notorious Gregory Clause which drove thousands off their land into fever-ridden workhouses, the mass evictions and subsidised emigration for the purpose of land consolidation, the niggardly sum spent on relief work, less than £10 million, in contrast to almost £70 million spent on the Crimean adventure. By all of these measures, half-measures and non-measures, the British government dispatched hundreds of thousands to their needless deaths. It is these baneful policies that a certain species of modern historian would ask us to judge tolerantly, relativistically, in the light of the wisdom of their day. But there is more to British responsibility than that. In his bold, brilliant study, Why Ireland Starved, Joel Mockier advances a series of controversial theses, that Ireland was not overpopulated, that its relative lack of raw materials was no adequate reason for its non-industrialised condition, that insecurity of land tenure played no major role in low agricultural productivity, that agrarian agitation proved no significant factor in deterring investment. Mokir adds, for good measure, that Britain could most certainly have saved Ireland from the famine had it possessed the will to do so, a judgment reinforced by Christine Keneally's This Great Calamity. The country's plight, so Mokir considers, sprang chiefly from lack of capital investment, rendering its economy peculiarly vulnerable to exogamous shocks, such as the failure of the potato crop. And the primary cause of that low investment was the poverty of its people. But Mokir does not press this question in turn to its root cause. Instead, he veers into a critique of the largely discredited case that union with Britain was the source of Ireland's economic ills. But why was Ireland so poor? The answer is doubtless complex, but it must surely include the fact of a vastly inequitable system of agrarian capitalism which was implanted by the British, run by their political clients, and conducted largely for their economic benefit. Had that exploitative system been transformed, rent abolished, the graziers and strong farmers expropriated, and their land equitably redistributed, a million men and women would surely not have perished. The empiricist historian would scoff at the idle utopianism of such a suggestion, and would be perfectly correct to do so. Such a revolution could not have conceivably happened at the time. Neither the political will nor the political muscle for it were available. But the point of such subjunctive or counterfactual speculation is to place the ultimate responsibility for the disaster where it belongs, which is to say, not with the landlords or the British, but with the system they sustained. Amartya Sen has persuasively advanced the counterintuitive case that famines are not primarily caused by food shortage, they are caused chiefly by lack of entitlements, the incapacity of the people to buy what food is available. Three million people perished in Bengal in the 1940s, though arithmetically speaking there was enough food for everyone. The application of this case to the Irish famine is problematical. Certainly rents were an important factor in preventing the bringing of the people and the food together. Cormac O'Grada has argued that there was, strictly speaking, enough grain in the country to feed all of its people, but that this, among other things, ignores the negative effects of crop requisitioning on subsequent production. But if, so O'Grada argues, one considers the relevant food area as the United Kingdom rather than Ireland alone, then the Sen thesis is a forceful one. In this sense, it can be reasonably claimed that the Irish did not die simply for lack of food, but because they largely lacked the funds to purchase food which was present in abundance in the kingdom as a whole, but which was not sufficiently available to them. In this sense, the famine was the most lethal consequence of Britain's tendency to ignore when it suited it, the union which it had oiled so many palms to achieve. As far as this particular catastrophe goes, it was not the union which contributed to Ireland's ills, but Britain's self-interested decision to set it aside.
and the ultimate cause of this, whatever Trollope might have considered, was a matter of politics and property relations, rather than of an all-merciful providence.